the Tories are in free fall. But how much damage can they do before we get the chance to kick them out? Um, that's our main story tonight. I'm feeling a little bit nervous about it. I'm also feeling nervous about the developments in the Russian war on Ukraine. Putin has annexed large parts of Ukraine, which makes it seem like it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to find some kind of peace deal. We will also um, be looking at the last episode of The Labour Files, that's the Al Jazeera documentary. Joining me all evening is Maurice McLeod, Chief Executive of Race on the Agenda and a Labour Councillor. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Maurice. Um, we've had Maurice on multiple times before, but this is the first time as a co-host, so I'm very excited about that. Let me just get my papers correct. The Tories have tanked the pound, almost crashed Britain's pension system, and everyone's mortgage rates are about to skyrocket. Perhaps then, it should be no surprise that they are 33 points behind in the polls. Yes, you heard that correctly. According to YouGov's latest survey, Labour are on 54% and the Tories are on 21%. Of course, there's time for that to change between now and a general election, but it's certainly a steep mountain for anyone to climb. And we might also worry about what damage Truss and Kwarteng might do in the meantime. According to the Times, ministers are drawing up plans for real terms benefit cuts, saving £5 billion by increasing them in line with earnings rather than with inflation. Truss was warned by analysts that she would have to make cuts on the scale of Osborne's 2010 austerity budget to balance the books by the second half of the decade. And the FT report it might be spending on capital projects and research and development that would be the early targets for saving. So a government which promised to level up and spur economic growth is going to cut benefits and slash investment. It's all pretty terrifying. And this time it's so nutty, even the Telegraph are having their doubts. Their world economy editor yesterday wrote a comment piece titled, Liz Truss is embarked on a course of sheer madness taking the Bank of England with her. The subheading, recent events are the result of the fiscal misadventure of a careless ideological government. The piece, um, which is worth reading, ended with this warning. The clock is ticking. The bank will stop its emergency bond purchases on October 14th. If the Prime Minister digs in and refuses to make any substantive change over the next 12 days, we can assume that global investors will again decline to finance her fiscal expansion. The Bank of England will then face a choice. It can either resume bond purchases, lose all authority and go the way of the Turkish Central Bank, or it can raise rates to 5% or 6% to try to stem a combined run on the pound and the gilts market, causing a housing crash and a bloodbath of business bankruptcies. Nor is there any guarantee that the latter course would stabilise the financial system. One hates to say it in a Tory newspaper, but the government seems embarked on a course of sheer madness. So to decode that, he's saying if the government doesn't U-turn, the Bank of England will have to keep printing money to buy government bonds, and then no one will believe they're really independent. They'll just do whatever uh, the government wants them to do to allow the government to continue on their kind of bonkers policy course. Or um, the Bank of England will need to hike interest rates, and that could cause a housing crash and a load of businesses to go bust. So we've, we've got some pretty bad options ahead of us. Um, Maurice, I suppose there's, you know, there's the economic side of this, what will happen over the, the next couple of weeks. There's also the political side. And do you think the Tories have basically lost the next election over the past seven days? I mean, it's, it's bizarre, isn't it, Michael? I mean, I grew up sort of thinking of the Tories as this unbeatable election machine that just always does whatever it takes to win elections. And if someone's you know, unpopular, they get rid of them and they they chuck someone else in and they just keep doing and they, this, this, um, I, I, I was listening to uh, the, the mini budget, I don't know why it's called a mini budget, but I was listening to the mini budget and I just thought, this sounds like a, like Labour have planted someone in the Tory to make them look bad. If you wanted a, if you wanted a, a, a you know, a, a financial source uh, event that, that says we are for the rich and we're not for you guys, it's it's what they just did. So so, um, you know, I, I have to be honest. I was sitting there thinking, okay, what's the catch? Why are you why are you being so obviously? Uh, why are you so obviously damaging yourselves? Um, um, you, you know, you have to lean on 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 the side that that trust is 
is genuinely uh, incompetent. You can't. I can't think why she would, she and, and Kwasi would be be following this path. Um, and and to see the polls, I mean, thirty a thirty three percent lead is is it's sort of it's back to things can only get better times of Blair. So when he was in his full on honeymoon, I'm half inspecting sort of ever small or Damon Auburn to, to burst out. Um, it's, it's unthinkable um, how badly they're doing. Um, and, and I'm, I, 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 I am still stunned that, that, that they're letting this happen. And, you know, they haven't got the option of ditching her again. So I don't know what they're going to do. There has been suggestion today that what the Conservative Party might do is not vote through this mini budget. So normally, you know, the proper budget would be considered a confidence vote. If a government cannot get through their budget, the convention would be that they should resign and you should have a general election because that's the main, that's the most significant piece of legislation you're going to pass in a year. If you can't pass it, you've got real problems. I think because this wasn't called a budget, it wasn't even called a mini budget, it was called a fiscal event or a plan for economic growth, um, I think laughably. Um, Tory backbenchers are now considering allying with the Labour Party, not necessarily to vote the whole thing down, but to make certain amendments, for example, getting rid of that cut to the 45p rate um, for income tax. I think the mistake the Conservatives made is they're like, well, this this 45p rate, this is two, three, four, five um, billion, which when you're looking at the total giveaway that they have announced, it seems small. So like, why not put that in there? Why not put that red meat to our base? But what they've completely misunderstood is that if you do that at this point in time, one, you look completely crazy to the financial markets because like, what, what, what remotely rational government would do that right now? And then also to the public, you look completely out of touch. And now they're in this perfect storm where the public quite rightly, associate the economic collapse we're experiencing with a decision made by the government to give the super rich a tax cut. And I think this is completely terminal. We're going to go back to the politics of this throughout the show because there have been a lot of sort of events to hone in on Liz Truss interviews, a really brutal um, episode of Question Time last night. First of all, I want to um, point out one thing that is, I suppose, worrying me, confusing me, let's say, because the hike in interest rates could create a scenario about which I have some very mixed feelings. That's because it could put out of business lots of buy-to-let landlords. So the Guardian reports this. The financial markets have signalled that the Bank of England may need to raise interest rates to 6%, while some analysts have suggested house prices could fall by up to 20%. Some investment property owners are in effect faced with two options. Raise the rent in the hope that a tenant will pay it and keep the landlord in profit territory or sell up. They also quote an asset manager saying this, we are advising our clients to sell out of buy-to-let properties, especially those in prime central London and held in personal names such as, as such investments will remain stressed and potentially unprofitable in the near future. Now, the reason I have very mixed feelings about this is because I think buy-to-let landlordism is a stupid way to run our housing system. It means that those people lucky enough to have capital get to take out mortgages and then have poorer people pay them off. You know, I can't afford a house, so I have to pay someone else's mortgage. This doesn't seem very fair. They're not doing anything useful. There's no value added. It's just a transfer of money from those without property to those who do have it. But why I feel complicated about this is because at the same time, for many of us, myself included, staying in these exploitative relationships is the only way to keep a roof over our head. So I'm now pretty nervous if, if my landlord were to send a letter. Obviously, we've got terrible tenants' rights in this country. So if I were to get that call, we've decided we're going to sell the house um, because it's no longer profitable to rent it out to you. Like, I'm not going to say, oh, poor landlord, he's not making a profit anymore for doing nothing. But I am going to think, oh, shit, what do I do now? You know? Like, obviously, I would, uh, uh, if I had enough money, I'd be like, great, I'll buy it from you. I'm no longer going to pay your mortgage. I'll pay my own mortgage. But I can't afford to do that. So what am I going to do? And I, I imagine there could be a situation where there are a lot of landlords over the next few months, either hiking rent or selling up. And then you're going to have an awful lot of people chasing a smaller number of rental properties. Now, the reason we're in this stupid situation where I'm worried about buy to let landlords going out of business, why am I doing this? I, why do I have to do this, let's say? I think it's, you know, probably the, the, one of the most pointless roles a society could ever come up with is because there is currently no alternative. We're in this terrible bind. And I was thinking today, I was thinking, what would the alternative be? What should happen 
if we had a rational government at this point in time, they'd say, look, the housing market is in housing stress. We've got this completely irrational system where we're we're making poorer people just transfer half of their income every month to richer people when the richer people aren't doing anything. Let's remove this situation while somewhat propping up the housing market. Now, in the long term, I'm not in favor of propping up the housing market. I think prices do need to come dramatically down. If they come down by 20% in the space of six months, you could have problems, right? Again, I, I, this isn't really a... Uh, no, I am going to feel sympathy for some people, actually. I'll feel sympathy for some people who just, you know, they wanted to get a first-time house because they were sick of renting a property. They got a mortgage six months ago. If it suddenly goes down in price and their interest rates go up, they are in a difficult situation. Obviously, I don't feel morally sorry for the, the buy-to-let landlords, but you could have um, a, a crisis which would be bad for the economy, would be bad for jobs. So I would say government should prop up the housing market for a while, or at least make sure that that decline isn't a complete collapse, and do so by when there's a buy-to-let landlord that says, oh, I'm not making a profit anymore, I want to sell my house, say, okay, we'll buy it. Let's bring it into public ownership. If we bring those buy-to-let houses into public ownership, then we can move away from this completely insane, irrational system. And now would be the time to do it. You know, because if you are a government that wants to nationalize these things, you don't do it when property prices are booming. You want to do, you want to buy in the dip, as those YouTube investors always tell you. you if you want to get passive income by becoming a private landlord, buy in the dip. Now we need the state to buy in the dip. Of course, it won't happen. We have Liz Truss in, in government, and that's why I remain very nervous. Um, but I still think it is worth sort of pointing out the alternatives that we could have if there were rational people in charge. Russia has officially annexed four regions of Ukraine, amounting to 15% of the whole country. The four regions are Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, and Zaporizhia. And in sham referendums, they all voted by between 97 and 98% to join Russia. I don't know why they don't just say 60% and it's a bit more believable. The four regions join Crimea, which was annexed in 2014. Vladimir Putin made the formal declaration of their annexation in a ceremony at the Kremlin. You know, in Donetsk and Lugansk national republics, in Zaporozhsk and in Kherson regions, there were a referendum. In the end, the results are known. People made their own choice. A unanimous choice. Сегодня мы подписываем договоры о принятии в состав России Донецкой Народной Республики, Луганской Народной Республики, Запорожской области и Херсонской области. Уверен, что Федеральное Собрание поддержит конституционные законы о принятии и образовании в России четырех новых регионов, четырех новых субъектов Российской Федерации, потому что это воля миллионов людей. And the Russians wrapped up the day with a pop concert in Red Square. Um, so you can see hundreds of people. We can't play the tune because copyright reason means they often get taken off YouTube. But this is a very cheesy number. I think you've got lots of Russian pop stars up there and then um, hundreds of people in the audience waving Russian flags. Although I have to say the square doesn't look particularly rammed. I mean, that's lots of people. It doesn't look to me like hundreds of thousands of people say. So maybe we can infer something about the extent to which there is mass popular approval um, for these illegal annexations. Um, Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, was quick to react, announcing an accelerated application to join NATO. It is here in Ukraine that the values of our Euro-Atlantic community have obtained real vital energy. The strength of the nation that fights for freedom and the strength of nations that helped in this fight. We are de facto allies. This has already been achieved. De facto, we have already completed our path to NATO. De facto, we have already proven interoperability with the alliance standards. They are real for Ukraine, real on the battlefield and in all aspects of our interaction. We trust each other, we help each other, and we protect each other. That is what the alliance is. De facto, today Ukraine is applying to make it de jure under a procedure consistent with our significance for the protection of our entire community, under an accelerated procedure. We know it's possible. We have seen Finland and Sweden start accession to the alliance this year without a membership action plan. This is fair. This is also fair for Ukraine. This is the consolidation at the level of a treaty of what has already been achieved in life and what are our values. 
Jens Stoltenberg, NATO's general secretary, gave a news conference shortly afterwards, and he said this, Putin has mobilized hundreds of thousands more troops, engaged in irresponsible nuclear saber rattling, and now illegally annexed more Ukrainian territory. Together, this represents the most serious escalation since the start of the war. Um, I actually agree, um, at least with the final part of that statement. I do think this annexation is probably the most serious escalation since the start of the war. And the reason I say that, obviously, I don't think anyone's going to recognize that this is a legitimate referendum. I mean, with Crimea, at least you could say that in those regions, there was historically lots of people that wanted to be part of Russia. Crimea was historically part of Russia, even in those parts of the Donbass, which had those referendums, which were again, illegal and very much disputed in 2014. It did seem like there was at least some kind of organic separatist movement. Here, you, you know, the pretense is just ridiculous. I, I haven't seen anyone uh, on on Twitter, anyone outside of the Kremlin essentially saying, oh no, there are actually loads of people in Kherson and Zaporizhia that want to join Russia. Let them uh, have self-determination. Like no, no one is buying this. It, it is completely ridiculous. It's also a desperate move by Vladimir Putin because he seems to be losing on the battlefield. The reason though it's so scary and why I think it is such an escalation is because unless you're sort of hoping that Vladimir Putin is going to is going to fall, that there's going to be a democratic revolution in Russia. And yeah, let's fight till the end. And hopefully the best of all possible worlds will be the outcome. If you're skeptic about that, which I am as well, then what you're hoping for is some kind of off ramp for both sides. You know, you can have some stalemate situation whereby Putin has something he can sell to his people. Zelensky has something he can sell to his people. For example, you know, Crimea, going to to Russia, Ukraine deciding never to join NATO. And obviously those weren't the, the real ambitions of Vladimir Putin, but he can go back to Russia and say, oh no, I always said this was what I wanted to do and we've done it. Um, I've won, yay. The media will will agree with me because I control all of them. That really is sort of the, the best case outcome here. Other than this very, very unlikely one where there's a democratic revolution in, in, in Russia and it doesn't lead um, to, to catastrophe, which is also quite Quite possible. So if you're going for this realistic one, well, what I think is a realistic one of both sides realizing um, they're going to have to come to some kind of fudge and sell it to their respective populations. This makes that incredibly difficult. Because if, if Vladimir Putin has now told the Russian people, organized a pop concert where they all turn up, this would have been televised across Russia, said, these four parts of Ukraine are now parts of Russia. I don't see how he can possibly sell to the Russian people anything other than those parts of Ukraine continuing to be controlled by Russia. And uh, it, it's such a broad part of Ukraine and parts of Ukraine, which, you know, it's completely ridiculous to suggest want to be part of Russia that I, I don't see how Ukraine can accept those terms either. So you are in what looks like a bit of an impossible situation. I, I can't see how they step back from this. And then the fear there is that you're getting closer to some kind of nuclear exchange which is obviously terrifying. Now, you know, I don't know the answer here. I'm not an expert when it comes to nuclear strategizing and how you can get two different sides in a, um, well, it's not a stalemated war, but in a situation such as this to, to back down. Or, you know, obviously I'd prefer the Russians to back down, but the main thing I want to do is avoid nuclear annihilation, right? So it's terrifying. I'm completely terrified by this, more than I have been, I think, since, since the first outbreak of the war. And I suppose I would also say, you know, as I say, it does seem hard what the off ramp is going to be, but I would still say let's, it, 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 it's still not a time for saber rattling. I really hope that the Americans are speaking to the Russians and they're sort of talking about how do we avoid firing nukes at each other? Because there, there is no worse outcome than that. After the fallout from Kwasi Kwarteng's mini-budget last Friday, Liz Truss disappeared entirely. We didn't see or hear from her for nearly a week. Then suddenly, on Thursday, she reappeared, not on one of the big national breakfast shows or news night, but in an hour-long series of seven-minute interviews given to BBC local radio stations. Let's take a listen to Trust on Radio Leeds and Radio Kent. Since Friday, since your Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng's mini-budget, the pound has dropped to a record low, the IMF has said that you should reevaluate your policies and the Bank of England has had to spend 65 billion pounds to prop up the markets because of what they describe as a material risk. Where have you been? Well, I think we've got to remember the situation we were facing this winter. Lots from my listeners this morning. Carrie in Birchington says 
What on earth were you thinking? The country was already in a state of recession. And another says, how can we ever trust the Conservatives with our economy again? And Lydia says, are you ashamed of what you've done? Are you? I think we have to remember what situation this country was facing. We were going into the winter with people uh, expected to face fuel bills of up to £6,000, huge rates of inflation. And you've made it worse. But also slowing, slowing economic growth. Over and over and over again, she gave the same stupid answer. Are you are, are you embarrassed that you crashed the economy? Well, it was a difficult winter. There was a war in Ukraine. You know, gas bills were going to be high. Everyone saw what happened. The timings, the timings were quite specific. Your chancellor announced a mini budget, which gave huge tax cuts to the rich. And then the pound collapsed, government bonds collapsed, and now interest rates are going to rocket and banks withdrew all of their mortgages. Not all of their mortgages, but lots of their mortgage offers, right? The timings, you, you can't say this is about winter. This is not a seasonal thing. Um, you can't say this is about Russia because Putin invaded Ukraine a long time ago. The timings mean this was about the mini budget that you announced on Friday and the whole country knows it, which is why the whole series of interviews are so embarrassing. And we do have some more for you. So next up was Nottingham. And this government has taken decisive action. And of course, in that decisive action to lower the tax burden, to get economic growth going, to help people with energy bills, which is the biggest part of the mini budget we announced is the energy bill support. You know, that is important. But in the my choices view, you've made in this, this mini budget is going to benefit far greater those who are very, very well off. If you make a million, you're going to benefit 55 grand a year from the tax cuts. On 20k, like a teaching assistant or a nurse, 157 pounds. A couple of people have said to me here in Nottingham, this is like a reverse Robin Hood. That that, that simply isn't true. Which By bit far of it? the biggest part of the of mini. It? Well. That the tax the cuts are disproportionately benefiting the wealthiest. Lots of people have pointed out Liz Truss's, uh, let's say, not superb communication skills. But to be fair to her, um, I don't think even the best communicator, not even Barack Obama, could have pretended a tax cut for the top 1% is anything but a reverse Robin Hood. It didn't get much better in Stoke. Too often tax policy has just been seen as being about distribution. It's not. It's also about how we grow the size of the pie so that everyone can benefit. By borrowing more and putting our mortgages up. We need to borrow more this winter for the energy crisis that we're facing. And we're I think that was the right thing mortgage. to do. We're going to is... gonna put, spend more in mortgage fees under what you've done based on the predictions than we would have saved with energy. I don't think anybody is arguing that we shouldn't have acted on energy. She had to think for such a long time before coming up with that stupid answer. And of course, you are right, Liz. No one is arguing that you shouldn't have acted on energy. What they're arguing is that you shouldn't have crashed the market with pointless and uncosted tax cuts for the rich. This was Liz versus Radio Tease. The government has taken decisive action to help families and businesses with their energy bills this winter. And we've also taken decisive action to get the economy growing and get Britain moving. And that is what ultimately will help all of us pay our bills. But what kind of decisive action, Prime Minister? Because your decisive action so far has knocked 40% off people's pensions. So what, what decisive action are we talking about here? We are facing a global economic crisis following Putin's appalling war in Ukraine. What decisive action are you taking? It seems like your action crashed everyone's pensions. Did, did, I, did I tell you there's a war in Ukraine? Did I tell you there's a war in Ukraine? It's not very persuasive to anyone. Um, let's end in Bristol. Because of the war that Vladimir Putin has perpetrated in Ukraine and countries are under pressure around yeah, but the this world, isn't, of course. This isn't Putin. This isn't just about Putin. I mean, your Chancellor on Friday opened up the stable door and spooked the horses so much you can almost see the economy being dragged behind them. This is about Putin and the war in Ukraine. That is why we so are So the Bank of England's intervention yesterday crisis. was the fault of Vladimir Putin, was it? What I'm saying is it's very difficult and stormy times in the international markets 
And of course, the Bank of England is independent. It takes the action it needs to take. And it is responsible for interest rates and it is responsible for financial stability. This is essentially trying to now blame the Bank of England, I think, as well as blaming Vladimir Putin. Um, Maurice, I want your take on this. Um, she was doing that for like an hour. There were seven interviews. They were all as bad as each other. Did you, by the end of it, did you, did, did at any point you develop any sympathy for her? I enjoy mocking Tories as much as the next person, but th there was a bit where it just started to seem cruel. It's like, okay, don't, don't let her do anymore. I mean, she, she clearly, it, it seems like she took a week off after the, the, the mini budget to, to have media training and be really ready for, yeah. for these local journalists. <laughs> and she's just come out and, and I mean, I mean, honestly, I, I'm, I'm shocked at how bad she is. I know people talk about the way that she um, sort of pauses and all that, but um, I, I don't think, and then people try to make excuses saying, oh, well, that's just her style. And maybe she's going to actually be delivering. And didn't we want to get away from all that over charisma with sort of Boris Johnson? <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I, I rarely feel sorry for, for a Tory, but I was listening to those going, look, just, just phone in sick. Just say you've come down with COVID. You can't talk. You can't go in on any, any, any radio stations because you're not doing any good. Um, and it's damn insulting as someone that sort of, you know, knows lots of local journalists and, and, and whatever. It's damn insulting for her and her team to think that she could just sort of roll on and, and sort of, um, open her mouth and, and pour out a load of nonsense about, Oh, yeah, saying decisive action, that's, that's the equivalent of actually doing something. So saying that over and again, um, it, it, you know, what, what an insult that she thought that she could just roll out and say that stuff. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I despair. And, and as much as I, I would normally enjoy it, there are bits where I, I, I think this is too cringy now. I need, you need to switch this off. And let's not forget this is, you know, this, this is having an impact on actual people. This is going to have an, an impact on actual people's lives. So as much as, you know, we can all laugh at a failing Tory. Um, you know, it's our people. It's it's working class people that are going to sort of bear the brunt of this as ever. It's, you know, she's already talking about cutting benefits. I think that is why people are so angry about this. Like, it, 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 it's a little bit similar to I think the Dominic Cummings going to Barnard Castle moment because you've got a politician who's going on television and saying something which everyone can see as nonsense, right? And Everyone's going through a very difficult period in their life. So back then it was lockdown. Now it's the fact um, that the cost of living is is incredibly difficult. And if you are someone with a mortgage, then you, you're scared that that's going to go up from 4% to 10% or whatever. I'm sort of picking these numbers out of the air. But you're worried that your monthly mortgage payments are going to massively go up. And then you turn on the radio and you've just got this politician just openly gaslighting you. You know, it, it it's so obviously untruthful what Truss is saying there. She's saying this is because of Russia. This is because of um, the winter. We can all see that the mini budget happened on Friday. Everything crashed on Friday, right? It, it, how stupid must you think people are to not see that? And that's why I think people take such offense. It's, it, it, because she is talking to us as if we are stupid. The, the only reason you could think that you would get away with the argument that Liz Truss is making is if you thought everyone in Britain was stupid. It was, it was a very, very similar fe feeling when it was the Dominic Cummings, Barnard Castle thing. Boris Johnson saying, oh no, this is completely normal. This is what any good father would do. Like how stupid does he think we are? And that's where we are at this point. And that's why it's not particularly surprising they're 33 points behind in the polls, even if 33 points is, is you know, a, a particularly dramatic um, number. Um, on that point of local journalists, which you mentioned there, Maurice, there was um, before that round of interviews some speculation um, that Liz Truss would get an easy ride on local media. Paul Mason um, was someone who made such speculations. He tweeted, it's Operation Rolling Partridge, Liz Truss is going to hit BBC local radio stations this morning where a bunch of sleep-deprived non-expert presenters will throw her soft questions while she dodges the heavy hitters. Now, this was a tweet which united, I think, everyone on Twitter, left and right from all sides of the spectrum, saying this is a terrible take, Paul. Um, because, yes, you know, on one level, it's potentially the case that these local radio hosts who, you know, have to be... Uh, be able to talk about all sorts of different things because they're, you know, they're a bit of a jack of all trade in a way. They might not have the expertise that Robert Peston has. You know, he's a political editor for ITV, used to be, you know, an economics editor. 
But they do have the advantage of not being very, very close to everyone in Westminster. Um, so as was talked about on an Navarra Media panel on Sunday, which Maurice was on, one of the big problems with lobby journalism, so Westminster lobby journalism, is your job is based on having access to powerful people. You don't want to give them too tough a time because then they're not going to give you the briefings you need. If you want to have that exclusive treasury source says X, Y, you have to be on good terms with someone in the treasury. So all of these people in Westminster, they might have various forms of expertise. I wouldn't actually overstate it, to be honest. But they also have on the, you know, on the other side of the ledger, they're terrified of upsetting anyone in power. So that might be why uh, these interviews with local radio stations were slightly more effective because they don't need these guys on side. They're probably never going to interview Liz Truss again, and she's never going to give them secret briefings via their WhatsApp. So they might as well make their splash when they have that chance. After Truss and Kuateng crashed the markets, this week's BBC Question Time was a difficult one for the Tories. This was the audience intervention that went most viral. Yeah, I just want to know what the plan is for mortgages because I was actually in the process of getting a mortgage as a young person and I was told my initial interest rate would be 4.5%. Um, and I was told today that the lender has pulled that offer and now the best offer that I can get is about 10.5%. Um, wow. Yeah, and they're saying that, you know, you need to immediately look at sort of putting your application through because if you don't, uh, the lenders may even pull these offers. And for me now, as someone, as a first-time buyer, um, I mean, I don't think I can now afford that to get a mortgage. Friday? Yes. Yeah. So, just, so let's just yeah, hear a bit more right. about that because yeah, that's that's yeah. an extraordinary. So I was given this jump. initial rate about uh, two weeks ago. So we were in the process of getting all the documentations together, uh, making sure everything is correct, ID and all of those things. Um, and today I was told, you know, uh, the lenders are pulling those offers. Those offers are no longer there. And are they giving you any? What are they saying to you as to why they're doing that? So they're they're just saying that the lenders are pulling the offers. That's it. They haven't said anything else. And they said now the best offer that we have is about ten point four percent. Wow. wow. Right. Does that make um, you uncomfortable? Paul, which, as a first-time buyer, that, I, I mean, think you can that's imagine it's—it's uh, uh, it's almost you can't—you can't do it. It was really interesting that um, reaction I thought from the audience, the way they all drew their breath, because I think in a way that that clip wasn't as impactful for me because I've—I've I've never had a mortgage, so the idea of a mortgage going from four percent to ten percent is very abstract to me. My rent went up by. 15% this year. So just, if you just throw these percentages at me, that doesn't make me go, whoa. But if you are someone with a mortgage, then you know what these percentages mean. And as far as I understand it, a mortgage going from 4% to 10% could sort of double your, your payments because of how um, these things work. And lots of the country are mortgage holders, right? Most of the country are, are homeowners. I think about half of them own outright. So they used to have a mortgage and half of them currently have a mortgage. So this is obviously something which, you know, I don't relate to particularly, but loads of people do. And lots of potential Tory voters do as well. So Tories dominate homeowners in the electorate. Labour are much more dominant in the in in, in the select in the, in the part of the electorate who who rent their homes. So the Tories have done something here, which prompts a visceral reaction from homeowners. If interest rates have gone from four percent to ten percent for these mortgage offerings, because of that mini budget on Friday, you've got all of these people who might vote Tory going like, "Oh, this is huge," you know. This is the kind of thing that sort of Labour voters might have noticed during the austerity years, but now loads of Tory voters are noticing because the Tories, for some bizarre reason, <laughs> have decided to screw over their base, which is homeowning Britain. Um, Maurice, I want your take on this. Um, why do you think they have done this? How, you know, it, it seems almost suicidal, doesn't it? You can't... Um... You can't help but think it's incompetence because I can't, I, like you say, I can't see any way that they would think this is a good idea. This is their core. This is their core base. It's like it's like them attacking, uh, I don't know, um, people who send their kids to private school or, or something, something along those lines. It makes no sense. And and uh, I mean, some of their their sort of pundits have been coming out and, and being quite honest, I think, and saying that I think trusts herself said I don't care about redistribution and. And some of them have been, been saying, sort of, you know, equality isn't actually something to aim for. I think if they were going to be honest and and, and sort of have those sorts of conversations, sure. Instead, they're they're, I don't know, they're 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 thrown under the bus. The very people, and and, and you know, don't, I, I feel sorry for that that young woman. I feel sorry for anyone who's who's trying to to secure a home. You know, which which often, you know, a first first time mortgage buyers sometimes are. Oh, they're trying to secure a home over their head to get out of this 
the 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 awful um private rented sector i feel sorry for anyone who's trying to do that um but at the bottom end of the at the other end of the the housing market you know there's 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 countless people we've got three and a half thousand homeless families in wandsworth you know so, so um something needs to happen with the housing market and if that means that buy to let properties we were speaking you were speaking about this earlier if that, if that means that they become untenable and 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 you know, mortgages become difficult to 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 get, and you know, and, and whatever, and house prices come down. Um, I know you were saying you'd have mixed feelings as as someone that works in a you know is, is on ones of housing committee. I would, I would really like um, benefit from from house prices becoming more reasonable and allowing the council to sort of uh, buy more affordable housing and things like that. That it wouldn't be a bad thing in in the long run for for us on that. Yeah, so actually, let, let's talk about this briefly. I should give the audience a bit more context. So Maurice was, I mean, you've been a Labour councillor for a while in Wandsworth, but Wandsworth have very recently taken, sorry, Labour have very recently taken Wandsworth Council from the Tories. So you've got a, a, a borough which has been, you know, very poorly run for the, you know, if you are a working class person in Wandsworth. You guys have now taken over. You said you're on the housing committee. So from your perspective, you know, this issue with mortgage rates going up, potentially buy to let sellers selling, potentially house prices going down. What are, you know, how, how do you think that will affect the people of Wandsworth? I, I, is there a way that Labour can sort of use this situation to actually make housing more available than it was before? Or do you think the negatives are going to outweigh the positives here? How are you approaching this? Yeah, it's, it, it's a difficult one, isn't, isn't it, Michael? Because, um, because yes, on, on one, in one breath, House prices going down is 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 very good for a council that's looking to to build more affordable housing. You know, our, our struggle is always, you know, a private market house is worth so much, uh, you know, in London that that it's really hard for us to 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 find the space to build the council homes that we want, the social housing that we want. So anything that changes that is is good for us in the longer term. But you know, like I say, I'm not going to sort of celebrate. Um, uh, uh, people that are, are are trying to buy their first home, not being able to do that—that's not a good thing. And and some of those people, uh, unfortunately, or people that get into trouble with 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 paying for mortgages, they're going to find themselves coming to the council needing support anyway. So it's not—it's certainly not a moment of celebration. But you know, it, it, you know, people will go through pain because of the mistakes that this this government are making. There are there are potential sort of silver linings as as. As we were saying, you know, if the housing market does lose some of its steam, that that has a potential, you know, medium term benefit, I suppose, to to, to affordable house uh, production and and and, and acquis acquisition. But but yeah, I, I I'm certainly not going to be celebrating people sort of defaulting on their mortgages and, and getting into trouble because because those are those are our people too. And and so so I you know um, yeah, mixed feelings, I guess, like like you were saying earlier. Mm. I mean, it's, it's obviously an incredibly complex situation, difficult to navigate. All I can say is I hope for the sake of the people of Wandsworth, that the people in your council are a bit more competent than whoever is running the Treasury Twitter account. Um, so the official Treasury Twitter account um, tweeted this um, this week. Uh, it was supposed to be a silver lining for first time buyers. They said, thanks to the growth plan, a typical first time buyer in London moving into a representative terraced house will save £11,250 on stamp duty and £1,050 on the household's energy bills. And if they earn £30,000, almost an additional £400 on tax. This is around £12,700 in total. So the, the message here, look, your mortgage rates might be going up, but if you're a first-time buyer, you've, you're you going to get £12,700 in uh, tax breaks, essentially. Um, so what are you complaining about? There is a problem, though, with this tweet, because to save £11,000 on stamp duty, the house this imaginary person would need to buy would cost £600,000. That's how much houses cost in, in London. And this typical first-time buyer, we are told, has an income of £30,000 a year. Now, that sounds very implausible, and it most certainly is. If you are on £30,000, the maximum mortgage you can get from a bank is around £120,000, meaning this typical first-time buyer would need to pay a £480,000 cash deposit. Um, so this typical first-time buyer turns out to be not particularly typical. Um, and I would say, again, this is the Tories putting up 
two fingers to us and taking us all for complete fools. Um, because if the only person your policy is benefiting is someone who happens to have quite a low income, but be sitting on £480,000 in cash, um, that's, that's a very small section of society. You might have to rethink your electoral strategy there. When the pound falls, most people get poorer, but not everyone. Specifically, those who have bet the currency will crash are able to make a tidy profit. It's called short selling, and it's exactly what this man did. This is Crispin O'Day. He's a hedge fund manager who's been betting that government debt would rise and that the pound would fall. As a result, his fund is said to have risen by 145% since the pound started falling. He's also Kwasi Kwarteng's former boss. Before becoming an MP, the Chancellor was an analyst for O'Day's firm, and the two still like to meet up from time to time. The Times reports this. Kwasi Kwarteng had a private lunch during the Tory leadership contest with a hedge fund boss who once employed him. Crispin O'Day, a hedge fund manager who has profited from the fall in the value of the pound and government debt, met Kwarteng at his home in London on July the 17th, when there were still six candidates in the running for the Tory leadership. Truss, the candidate who Kwarteng backed, made it on to the final two on July the 20th. Now, we're not suggesting that there was any wrongdoing here. At the time of the lunch, Kwarteng wasn't the Chancellor, though he was um, the Secretary of State for, for Business, not an entirely irrelevant job. And um, he came out in support of trust less than two weeks later. But Odie told the Times this, We have never discussed anything but the usual gossip of politics. At the time he came for lunch, it was not known who was going to win the leadership, and he wasn't particularly optimistic about getting one of the big free. So I presume that's a reference to one of the big free jobs. He didn't realise he was going to be Chancellor. Now, it's important to note, this is not the first time that O'Day has been incredibly lucky betting against the British economy. In 2016, on the night of the Leave vote in the European referendum, he made £220 million in one go when the value of the pound fell. And in 2019, he was criticised for making a £300 million bet against British businesses, including Royal Mail. Also in 2019, former Chancellor Philip Hammond accused Boris Johnson, who was threatening a no-deal Brexit, of being in hock to millionaire investors betting against the UK. O'Day was widely thought to be amongst them. Um, so Hammond wrote this. Johnson is backed by speculators who have bet billions on a hard Brexit, and there is only one outcome that works for them. A crash-out, no-deal Brexit that sends the currency tumbling and inflation soaring. So they, at least, will be reassured to see no evidence at all that his government has seriously pursued a deliverable deal. In other words, if the UK crashed out of Europe, Johnson's millionaire backers, including O'Day, stood to profit big time. O'Day described the claims as absolute rubbish, but he is a pretty big Tory donor. Over the past decade, his firm is reported to have given more than £1.7 million to the Conservative Party. He personally channelled £870,000 to various pro-Brexit groups, and he donated £10,000 to Johnson's leadership build, as well as £22,000 to Jacob Rees-Mogg. So what did he think of this week's crash in the value of sterling? He described it in the Financial Times as the gift that keeps on giving. Um, Maurice, I want your take on this. There's sort of lots of, um, do we call them a conspiracy theory? Anyway, theorizing, let's say. I think it's a bit much to call them a conspiracy theory. Really. It's not completely implausible. Do you think that, you know, it's, it, it's possible that Kwasi Kwarteng crashed the pound on purpose because a bunch of his friends have bet against the pound and they can get filthy rich if the pound goes down. Does that does that sound remotely plausible to you as an explanation for what's happened over the past week? To be honest, no, but I can I can see why people would think that. I mean it would be quite a quite a rock star move. You know, become <laughs> chancellor, crush the economy, make <laughs> make billions and whistle off into the into the sunset. That's that's gangster. But I, I I don't I don't think he's done this now 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 what I'm what I'm fairly certain ah you know who knows? We're not. We're not at these private dinners where they only talk about the, min you know, the minutiae of politics. And they don't get into money at all because they're not. They're not. They're not like that. They, these guys just chuck loads of money at, at individuals and, and the Tory party and whatever because they just like them. I'm sure. I'm sure that's the case. Um, it seems. It seems really unthinkable that that that. Um, Maybe not. Uh, he has not. Maybe not done it on purpose. But he certainly discussed what he was thinking. He certainly given information 
to his friend or his former boss or whatever. And, and then the friend or former boss has, has sort of gambled on that. And, you know, lo and behold, has come out a winner while we all lose. It's, it, at the very least, it's a really horrible look. It's a really, um, the idea that there's sort of people dancing around while, while others go to food banks and starve and lose their homes and, and all the things that, that, that are going to come about from this. Um, I, I always, I always think um, there's there's so many things that happen that you think, all right, okay, the country won't stand for this. You know, we, the, you know, we bail out the bankers and then have ten years of pain. I think, okay, well, we won't go for it again. But but I, I think we're just um, we must be the sort of nicest, most uh, accommodating nation ever. Because some of some of these things in other countries, you'd imagine you'd imagine people would be run out of town. Um, you shouldn't be making um, what's 145 percent profit. Um, on on our economy collapsing, yeah, yeah, something smells, but I don't, I don't want to point more of a finger than than would be fair. I mean, especially if you're friends with the chancellor. I think, yeah, I do quite like the idea that Quasi Quarto, this whole thing, that the whole career in politics was to ultimately become chancellor, to crash the pound, make loads of money, then go move to Hollywood or something. It's like I can get a nicer flat than Rishi Sunak. Everyone's talking about how wealthy he is. I can beat this guy. It's probably not the most plausible explanation for what's going on. The analysis I have heard, which I do find fairly persuasive, is that what this shows us is the kind of circles these people move in. And you can imagine if you're moving in these circles where you're, you know, you're in international finance, you're very mobile, you're betting against this currency, you're betting against that currency and give you a very cavalier attitude to these kind of things. So obviously, if you're someone who would never dream of betting on, on currency, you see these things not at this sort of exciting gamble, but you see this as a risk to your livelihood. If you're in this world of betting against this currency and betting against that currency, you can sort of imagine a kind of testosterone fueled meeting where they're like, fuck it, let's do it. Let's, t let, let's take a gamble in the markets and what's the worst that can happen? Might be a problem for our, our political career, but then we can go get a different career in the city. You know, I, I feel like the stakes are not that high for the people who are currently in number 10 Downing Street and who are currently in the Treasury. And that might be why they're taking such bizarre risks. The third episode of Al Jazeera's The Labour Files deals with what the Ford Report called a hierarchy of racism in the Labour Party. Let's take a look at a key clip. The Ford Report also describes a hierarchy of racism. The party's more recent steps to address the problems with anti-Semitism, for example, have not been matched by a commitment to tackle other forms of racism. When I would speak to my peers and the superiors about why we're not tackling Islamophobia and anti-black racism with the same ferocity as we were with anti-Semitism, the response was always, anti-Semitism is the organization's priority. As soon as an email would come in from the Jewish Chronicle, I would be told to stay behind and act on that case, even if it was just to suspend the member without even sending them questions, just so we can go back to the Jewish Chronicle and say, we've suspended this member. Other forms of discrimination do not result in automatic suspension. When we'd get lists from Labour Muslim Network, they would often sit in the complaint center for a while or in the complaints inbox. We weren't ever instructed to work on those immediately. The files show that journalist Rod Liddell is also being investigated. He'd written. For many Muslims, the anti-Semitism is visceral, an ingrained part of their unpleasant ideology. Party official Emily Oldno emails. He would be suspended under bringing the party into disrepute. Didn't want to do anything because he's a journalist without you knowing about it first. John Stolliday, the head of party's governance and legal unit, writes. Apparently Rod Liddell is chummy with Ian Austin and by extension, TW. I still want to do this, but we're not under pressure to do it. So may just sit on it for now. TW refers to then Deputy Leader Tom Watson, who along with MP Ian Austin opposes the Corbyn leadership. Two years later, Liddell is eventually suspended. Now I have to say, I didn't think that episode was completely flawless. It was sort of a moment where they were saying uh, there is this landlord who owns 10 properties, 33 Labour members live in them, but to question that would 
be, you know, dog whistle races. And I, I wasn't totally convinced by the whole program, but I think that clip um, we just showed you that was pretty indisputable that that's incredibly worrying. The idea that you have, you know, I'm, I'm not going to deal with it because he's friends with an MP. Can you imagine if that had been a left-wing staff member and a left-wing MP? Like, we wouldn't have heard the end of it. That would have been the front page of all of the national newspapers. But because this was right-wingers, because there was no vested interest in destroying an anti-establishment politician, no one cared. Also, I think what was notable there was finally seeing a network care about the Ford report. Now, what was in the Ford report was pretty goddamn hard-hitting. It was pretty newsworthy. And it was almost completely ignored by the mainstream media. You have to wait for Al Jazeera to release a documentary. Maurice, I want your, your take on this, both the Al Jazeera documentary and also the extent to which the Ford report has been completely ignored, both by the party leadership and by the media as well. Yeah, this is a huge issue, to be honest, Michael. Um, you know, as you say, I'm a, I'm a Labour councillor. I'm, I'm active in the party. I'm, I'm part of a... Um, uh, a, a group called Labour Black Socialists, where, where we talk quite a lot about about issues that that you know of racism, Afrophobia, um, um, Islamophobia within the party. Um, it makes it really difficult because it, it, it's it's. I think there's always been an issue with uh, institutional racism in in any organisation. So I, I'd say that there are issues even under under Corbyn. There were issues. Um, what seems to be the case now is that 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 Issues of, of of sort of black racism or Islamophobia or, or you know, um, they, they really are ignored. We really don't feel as if we're taken very seriously. Um, and 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 for you know, for you know, one of the most loyal, to be honest, demographics in this country when it comes to voting Labour and turning out and 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 being active, hearing that our you know, when we do get a representative into Parliament, you know, a Diane Abbott or a Clive Lewis or a Dawn Butler or, or whatever, when we hear that that they're being, um, you know, they're facing the, the crap that we sort of face on the outside, they're facing that from people within inside the party that, that I pay my, you know, my subs to every month is really difficult to take. Um, you know, we can all talk about... Um, Right now is the time to pull together in unity. We need to get rid of the Tories. Absolutely, sure. But but if if Labour is going to really bring change when it comes to things like structural racism, which you know I'm certainly crying out for, we need to be best practice. We need to we need to be the change that we want to see. We can't be a party that that quite frankly um, uh, ignores. Uh, uses race at most times as a factional weapon, and 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 ignores complaints from from black black and black and brown members because of where they're perceived to be politically. That that's very much how it feels. I mean, nothing in the Al Jazeera files was shocking. This all stuff that I feel like we knew. We knew that this sort of abuse was happening, um, and, and we knew these sorts of things go on because we have them happen to us. We have our own members being suspended. We, we are, we're being sanctioned for all sorts of things that shouldn't be sanctionable. Um, so, so yeah, this is, Labour really do need to get a grip with this. Keir really does. I know that there was the uh, apology, which was a bit more like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I say what he said. He apologised and I kind of agree with him. That's not, the, you know, he, he needs to treat our, communities with some respect and he needs to treat our representatives with some respect um i don't think this is this is the end of the conversations about the, the ford report i don't think this is the end at all um a lot of people are very upset yeah, i mean obviously the leadership want it to be the end of discussions about the ford report and the mainstream media are completely happy to let him have that like the extent to which this has been completely ignored in you know even the liberal press i just think is is disgusting, um, frankly. Let's go to a comment. Oliver Kant, what I find mad is that we have Tories in government like Suella Braverman using anti-Semitic dog whistles like cultural Marxism in the past and they're never called out on it. I think actually she was called out on it briefly. I think she had a meeting with the Board of Deputies or something, but um, she obviously was given a much uh, softer ride, let's say, than if she had been on the left um, because it wasn't, you know, uh, there wasn't an interest in destroying her like there would have been if she was a left-wing politician. Um, Maurice, thank you so much for joining me this evening. It's been a real pleasure um, being joined by you for the whole hour for the first time. I've enjoyed it, Michael, hanging out with the cool kids.
<laughs> we'll definitely we'll definitely get you back on soon um lots is happening this weekend enough is enough having a day of action tomorrow and the don't pay campaign also kicks in details for both of those are on their websites and with tory party conference approaching we'll have plenty to talk about on monday so get the popcorn ready make sure to come back here to this channel on monday at 7 p.m for now you've been watching tisky sour on navara media good night 